see the aesthetics of aesthetics and math exhibit that Hallie Cohn and Adam Ludwig worked on so hard. And each of these works has a different approach to mathematics. For instance, if you look at the head outside by Sarah Ferguson, she is a artist, but she's a mathematician too. So the equations on the head are real equations. You can check them out. Uh, and then you yes. see you see. You see uh, uh, Harish Lavani uses algorithms, Devon Powers, his work is based on symmetry, and Joan Walter Math uses Fibonacci type sequences. So all th these, this exhibit ran in tandem with our fantastic Templeton subsidized panels on math and beauty and math and religion. We had an amazing crowd here for Brian Green, the cosmologist, and Elaine Scarry from um, Harvard were here, and, and you had this, these kind of antipodes of the aesthetic and the scientific meeting together, and it was really quite amazing. We had this whole space was filled. You were here, Morty, weren't you? And then downstairs there were 50 people. And that's one of the things that Philotetes does, is it takes subjects that people would normally feel that are too maybe esoteric or that are not in the common wheel, and all of a sudden we show that there's an enormous interest in things that are not commonly considered of mass consumption value and, uh, and try to keep the integrity of them at the same time. Now, uh, coming up, we have some other events. Poetry continues at Philotetes on December 8th with Giants, Revolutionaries, Madmen, and Exiles, Latin American Poetry. <coughs> then and Now, but we're actually not calling it Then and Now. We have the exact name of the poets, but uh, which, who, which I don't remember. Uh, December 5th is our panel on time, and there'll be a, an art exhibit in, in tandem with that panel also. And on December 17th, we are presenting a round table. Uh, Sarah Rule, the playwright, who uh, in her play In the Next Room will be premiering at Lincoln Center. She's coming here with Ann Catanio, who's the dramaturg of Lincoln Center, and a panel of others. And they're going to be discussing the major subject of that particular play, which is vibrators. <laughs> so I was very eager to do this. <laughs> Uh, on December 19th, we are having Aging and Creativity, uh, and that is how our season ends, and it is a subject that is near and dear to my heart, because I am personally interested in the, in the late and great plays of both Ibsen and Shakespeare, and, and we have two um, uh, uh, dr dramatic critics from, from Yale, Gordon Rogoff and Ellen Fuchs, coming down to talk about that very subject matter, along with the dancer Carmen de Lavalade. So we're going to be talking about the fact that late in life, there isn't a necessarily a diminution of creativity, but some of the greatest works of art have been produced at those times. So there's a lot of fantastic stuff going on. In addition, I have to announce that we, have, we are going to be the recipient, I guess, of two grants from, from uh, New York State Council on the Arts in both music and in poetry. Uh, as, you, as, as you know, the, the math series was funded by Templeton. We received money from Bloomberg LP, but I'm going to say this quite bluntly. Unless we get help, we cannot stay alive. The grants we receive from government sources are small amounts of money that are project related and we need operating. So we need your help. We have PayPal on the site and we need donors who are well to do to come to the aid of Philoctetes. We need help to keep alive. We'll, we're going to be going through December. We think we have enough to go through January, but we are doing everything we can to raise money for Philoctetes now. Now, Jane Ira Bloom. Is it, last weekend, we had a panel on mathematics, and then Sunday we had a panel on, on uh, Bob Dylan. And that, to me, that epitomized what Philoctetes is about. But there are certain people who epitomize Philoctetes, and Jane Ira Bloom is that person. I mean, not only does she attend practically every Philoctetes event, she's an enormously accomplished musician, and, and really a part of, I don't like to use this word, uh, you know, the jargonese family, but she is here all the time, and I regard her as part of my family. So I'm very, very excited and proud to have Jane Arboom returning to Philoctetes for this event. So I welcome Jane. And Ms.
How's the sound for you? <laughs> but the piano, you just turn it down? Or? Uh, we figured we would start off by playing music for you. That was, uh, those were a couple of original compositions. Uh, one was called uh, Her Exacting Light. And then that piece that involved uh, all these wonderful uh, ideas <clears throat> on the drums was called Ready for Anything. And uh, before we go any further, uh, I have to just take a moment to thank these extraordinary musicians who are joining me here today. Um, I can't even go through the accomplishments that all these people have in their in their careers. Uh, they are equally world-class musicians, uh, composers, uh, performers, band leaders of their own. Um, please welcome the most extraordinary Mark Elias. Yeah! Right on. I don't know if we should let him know, Mark, how long you and I have known one another. <laughs> All right. Long time. Please welcome Don Clement on piano. Yeah. And the most extraordinary drummer, percussionist Matt Wilson. Thank you. <laughs> Jazz Times Magazine this month. You'll see him on the cover. I was, I was walking in Barnes and Nobles. I spotted his face on the cover. Whoa. Who was that magazine? <laughs> and Popular Mechanics. <laughs> wood and wine. Wood, 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 wood Magazine. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I uh, you know, I, I wrote this short paragraph about, you know, what we try to talk about today. Something that uh, kind of demystifying uh, a lot of the communication that goes on in a quartet of musicians who know each other really well. We've been playing together for I don't know how long, uh, but, and we've been recording and playing, and something happens <laughs> over that period of time that is hard to talk about, but we're gonna try to see what it is that's different about the way we play together because of this time that we have spent together. And what, one of the first thoughts I had, and Matt's already, he's, you wanna throw, <laughs> He threw down the gauntlet, he threw the red flag. I was ready to throw it down when we got up here. This idea I had was <laughs> that we try to do something that improvisers never do <laughs> in front of an audience, which is try to show you visually, while we're still playing, a moment where something feels suple supremely right, musically, emotionally, synchronously, and I don't know, we tip in, I don't mm -hmm. know, whatever. So Matt, now that you've thrown thrown up the gauntlet, you have to try to describe what made you feel like throwing it up then. <laughs> Let me see, Jane. <laughs> uh, no, uh, you know, the, 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 the mutual welcoming of surprise. I mean, we've played these songs a fair amount, but um, they're always in, in completely different. I mean, depending on the room, the orchestra, you know, the, I always go by the whole vibe of what's going on, you know. I improvise in the town, by the town sometimes, you know, mm -hmm. so the settings really make a difference. I don't know how I would be as a person that would go to a place where the stage is set up the same all the time and, you know, like, I don't, I think even rock bands know that, well, they're, sometimes they don't know, but I mean, the stadium set up, but I, I like the whole atmosphere of everything, so this kind of settings uh, open up us in a completely different way than we would if we were in a club or at a large festival setting or whatever. But uh, the reason I threw up the flag is because um, I thought the very ending note uh, without looking at each other or even not even really knowing we ended you know mm -hmm. that to me and actually yeah the description of the piece is that the bass is supposed to play with the drums for a while then I fade out then he ends the piece so because something else was happening Matt made the choice to end with me or we made the choice together unspoken and you know this this happens often I think it's a, it's it's part of the process um, and my personal experience is when I try to control things intellectually like become very aware intellectually while we're doing this and say, okay, we're going to end this together, you know, and then try to make that happen. It doesn't happen. It would never it happen. Never happen. <laughs> yeah. It would never happen. He'll go like, Psh, you know, yeah. this way. Yeah. So it's really like you just, you're just here, you're feeling it, and you just accept what comes in a way. And the, the less judgment involved, uh, the better, in my opinion, you know. 
It's, it's a very, very difficult thing to discuss because it's so subjective. And even in discussing it, it changes it in a way. You know, like Heisenberg said. So, um, <laughs> no, I'm Matt, serious. check him out. <laughs> Elias. And, and Schrodinger's cat. Yeah. <laughs> he's, so, in his, he's in his own. Yeah. <laughs> so, these people are interested to know, you know, we're talking about this elusive moment. To, to my ear, I've heard a lot of uh, people try to talk about improvisation and try to talk to people, you know, explain to people what, you know, what we're doing. And they use, often use an analogy uh, that we're having a conversation. And every time I hear that expression, I, I wince because that's, it's not the kind of dialogue that you have, like when you have conversation where somebody's talking, I'm talking to you and back. It's not that kind of thing. Try to imagine something that's more like being at a cocktail party where three of you are all talking about the same topic at the same time, and you all sort of feel like, yeah, you really, it's, it's as if, when we play a piece of music, we have an idea about the piece, you know, or we, have, so we all have different thoughts about it, but we have some sort of central idea about this piece, and we all look at it, and think about it, and play about it simultaneously. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and somehow that sounds better than if we were doing the same thing, but thinking about different things. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I don't know, that's the best, the best I can come up with. And it's, as, as my husband said, it's a different kind of bandwidth than conversation. Because our musical vocabulary encompasses a, a, a lot of other shared things. Um, I, don't, I wouldn't even know how to begin to, to go there. Well, I, I, I could speak to that a little yeah, bit, please. just because the idea in a conversation, for example, if you're having a conversation and the only thing you're doing is thinking about what you're going to say, you're no longer listening. So nothing's coming in. Uh, and it's the same with playing music. If you're, if you're thinking about the mistake you made a minute ago, you're no longer here in the present time available. Or if you're thinking about what's coming up, or like, oh my God, where's this going? You know, all that chatter in your brain, you know, it, it really is like a conversation with somebody who's thinking about what they're going to say. So you just have to let all that go. It's, a, it's kind of an odd Zen experience. And, and the thing is, it's, it's really an analog of life. You can't do anything effectively except now. And it, especially in music, it's like you can think about some slick thing you're going to play in five minutes or whatever, but you're no longer here now and you're no longer really available. So the other thing is that we somehow, in open form improvisation, are trying to create a, a, a coherent arc in a, in a, in a, along a timeline, but we can only do it now, and now is moving. So when you really think about it, it's impossible. <laughs> and then you're free. <laughs> you know. Beautifully said. Beautifully said. Thanks, Mark. I think well, we should, we'll play some more. Okay. Uh, yeah. I'm going to play a piece of music that is... Uh, thrilling to me. It's, it's, for me, it's a brand new piece of music. I just put it in front of them. We play, I think we ran through it once a few months ago, but we, we just had a little short rehearsal yesterday. And, oh, it's the one. It's and there was the Wing Walker. It's a piece called oh, Wing Walker. Walker. Oh, the oh, Wing Walker. Walker. And uh, I won't say anything else except it's the let's Wing do Walker. it. Oh. Forward back with that.
like that before. Um, just to let you in on a little bit of process, Don, would you mind just, uh, I want to show you when I compose this thing, here's what came first. Just, just the, you, know, you and I playing the line, Don. This is where it came from. <laughs> notation that I have to do that with me because we're we're slowing up we're speeding you know we're s slowing down we're speeding up we're doing all kinds of things so Dawn this is a question for you that's that's important to talk about how do you do it <laughs> yeah come on Dawn come on Dawn how do you give do it up it? baby give it up this is not an easy thing you know. uh, feminine into it no I'm just kidding <laughs> <laughs> I just try to listen and feel more than anything, um, and open myself up to being as musical as I possibly can mm -hmm. in the moment, even though I'm reading it, and I know what it is ahead of time. You know, because Jane might do it different every time. So just try to be on my toes ready. I always felt that, it, you know, I've played with a lot of pianists, um, but this kind of synchronous interpretation of a melody, you know, it doesn't happen a lot with all musicians or all pianists. And I often thought it might have had something to do with the fact that you're also a singer. Oh, maybe. Because you feel breath. Mm. You know, because it's feeling breath in the piano. If you listen to her lines, um, even when she's soloing, it, to me they're, they're filled with breath. And, and uh, that's something, breath, <laughs> that we have in common. Uh, so I've yeah. always felt that there was something that could be. In that. Mm -hmm. Any other thoughts to offer? Did any flags go up? I didn't see any. <laughs> I threw my flag up. I was there. Well, I, I was too busy, man. Sorry, yeah. I was busy too. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I find I'm getting busy. Any thoughts, Matt? I, there was a moment. I'm sorry, I missed it. So. Well, it's hard for me to reach the flag at times. <laughs> but, um, you know, getting back to conversation or, the, the, or people, the, you know, uh, how, what, what draws us into sound? What draws us into music? Um, whether whatever kind of music it is, for me, it's based. Uh, there are actually are I call them sonic dimensions. There are dimensions of sound that make us. Wow. Why? Why do we? You know, why do we like the? Uh, I like the Geico commercial. You know, with the little eyes because I like that synth sound that when it starts. Okay, hold on. roll your eyes, man. Come on. <laughs> but that's a sonic. That's a, a texture of sound 
that intrigues, you know, I can feel, wow, I feel like I can, you know, really play with that sound. So one of the things I think these guys do, and I like to use this word, is offer. They offer these sonic dimensions, which I think are, um, first of all, rhythm. I mean, rhythm is like the universal sonic dimension, right? Because if, if I go, you, everybody, well, usually we go like that, <laughs> if they're not afraid. So rhythm is something that is a, a, a sonic dimension right off the bat. Dynamics, articulations, all these musical terms that we use, like long, short notes, are things that draw us into sound. If somebody is just playing, you know, monotonal or, you know, like just the you know, same dynamic or same articulations, then it, that, or, and then they don't leave that space, like with the breath, to welcome you into the sound, then I think that makes a big difference also. So that's what's amazing to hear. Great articulation or great dynamics are things that draw us to the sound when somebody plays really quietly and you hear it or mm. we're drawn in or somebody plays a big, powerful note out of nowhere. It wakes us up or it opens, uh, it welcomes us in a completely different way. So I, I think what's great about a lot of Jane's music is, is that it's very little, uh, and I kind of follow this same kind of philosophy, is it's very little, if little, very little, if none at all, visual communication. It's all sonic. We know what to do by, by somebody doing something sonically. So, I mean, not that we can't also see, but because uh, our Blake uses that, you can see with your uh, ears and hear with your eyes. But I think that, uh, I think for me, when I, 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 musicians take anything sonically. So when people send those messages out, it's uh, well, things like this. And I think that's one of the reasons, too, it's so fun to play a piece like this. You can feel the breath. I, the first time I ever played with Jane, it just felt like the, I didn't have to do anything. Like the music just took my hands where I was supposed to go. And that's why I come back all the time. So I, was, <laughs> I was extremely tired that first week that I ever worked with her. Uh, so it was, and it, it did the job for me. So, uh, so shall we put you to work? Shall we do multiple choice? Yeah. yeah, yeah There's a piece of music that I composed very much with Matt in mind. Uh, it's called Multiple Choice. Uh, the concept. Uh, as you'll see, is for Matt to constantly surprise us. <laughs> Not even. <laughs> Thank 
The waltz is great. <laughs> <laughs>
it's all, exactly. a lot of love up here. <laughs> oh, beautiful question. No, I don't have it. I don't think I read it. Climbing side. Oh, that's the one with the chord changes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. But I didn't pull it out yet, so it's dark and all. Okay. There was this ballad oh. uh, I was interested here it is. to okay. play for you. It's called, it's a piece I wrote called A More Beautiful, beautiful Question. Sure. But it, it's, um, it was, it on your it was uh, a new adventure for me, both to play a song, a ballad this slow. I, I know we, I did a session here once where I talked about playing slow. But in addition to, to that, um, I wanted to try to play a melody that felt naturally attuned to my own sense of rubato. In other words, it's not metric. It just flows where I feel it. And yet the whole band is doing that. So here we go.
She threw the flag. She threw the flag. Can you give me that flag? I'll just, just blow that. I'm a sucker for balance. And, <laughs> and I just love the upper register of the soprano saxophone. It just does something to me. It's, and when it's all lined up, I just feel good. <laughs> uh, what shall we move on to? How about, uh, can't help it, we're in New York Psychoanalytic. We're going to play a brand new piece called Speaking of Dreams. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> this is also new, and it just, again, it, it's exciting because it just came into the air <laughs> yesterday. <laughs> yeah. Huh? Oh, okay. <laughs>
Tip it over. Speaking of dreams, uh, I just, uh, yeah, you know, I give it up, you know. <laughs> it was beautiful. I couldn't reach it. <laughs> well, you know, I, you know, time going by, we're playing a lot for you, but uh, we should take a moment. I'm sure you have some thoughts you'd like to share with us, or some questions for us. Sure, sure. There's some parameters for you mm -hmm. in, the, in, the in um see in, in the pieces we've been playing they have a lot of harmonic areas and yeah, what you're it yeah. somewhat depends on the strategy of the piece that's set out by the composer like uh, mm -hmm. meaning uh, for example let's say we had some kind of tonal melody with harmonic under underneath underneath it and then maybe the instruction would be to improvise in the, in the sense of that theme which would not necessarily mean that you would stay in that tonal center or even in that body of pitch material or information, but you might branch out just as a composer would in variations or, or thematic development start exploring different areas of, of tonality or non-tonality, you know, just in terms of color, you know, because every pitch really has a specific color. That's why people with absolute pitch recognize the color of individual notes. Uh, sort of absolutely, like an F-sharp always sounds like an F-sharp to them. So if you're improvising and you're in E-flat, just as a, as a choice, and then you, you, you hear uh, a relationship of a tritone away, which would be A, you might go there. Or you might juxtapose that sound. It really depends on the strategies laid out by the composer, though. Um, you know, if it's open form improvisation, then everything's available. Yeah. I would just say occasionally Jane notates harmony, and even though she puts a name on it, I think she's just hearing the shape and sound of that particular voicing. So it could have another name, but it's mainly a group of notes that she hears. So she does sometimes indicate harmony. But what I've really loved about playing Jane's music is a lot of times the line inspires your improvisation, the shape of the melody, or, I mean, sometimes, you know, you turn it upside down, and I mean, just, it's cool <laughs> to improvise off the line itself, and that, I don't know. Yeah, well, it's true, I'm a saxophone player. That's right. <laughs> I get lines, yeah. You said earlier that usually when you're playing, there's one theme or one idea that you all have. Yeah. Okay, okay. Um, let, let's uh, let's pull up night sky writing. Mm -hmm. um, it's not always that as specific as I'm describing it, but I'll, I'll we'll play a piece for you. It's called night sky writing, in which um, we have a kind of a stop and go unison head that we play. But the improvisation is completely open. It's just the only indication that I've given the musicians is to think of outer space. <laughs> um, let me see. Let's see if I can. I think I remember my own tune. <laughs>
this is a, just a question for me. Can, can you tell the parts that are composed and the parts that aren't? I've got an idea. <laughs> uh, if, if we can all do this ensemble. Uh, we're going to play the same thing again. We're not going to play the whole tune. But we're, gonna, we're all going to throw up the flags where the composed stuff stops and uh, the improvising stuff begins. Uh, maybe we should, or should we do it in another one? Or? That's fine. So this, this, this one, this one? Yeah. Okay. Let's revisit it. All right, let's, let's revisit it. Yeah, okay, we revisit. No. <laughs> Sorry. Too soon, too soon. <laughs> Stops, that's where the improv begins. <laughs> yes, please, if you have a thought or. <laughs> yes, please. I do have a thought. Um, in that piece, and also before when you did the multiple choice, um, there was an inside joke. You know, I could see the inside joke, and it delighted me, and I was curious about it, but it was particularly good because at the end you let us in on it. And that was da 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 da. <laughs> that. <laughs> it's, it's so interesting. Uh, the more I read about uh, neuroscience and I apply it to th thinking about expectation in music, that uh, com I, I've, I've thought about the fact that I think composers set, mentally set up expectations. And we delight, our mind just delights in their repeating, but only so, so far. And then, just when you think we're going to zig, we zag. And, and we delight it. It's like, you know, peekaboo, you know, or something, you know. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it was, it was visible as yeah. well as audible. That's fine. That's good you realize. Any other thoughts? Or, yeah, please. How do you notate that? I mean, giving everybody a line that you're playing off? I mean, I just, <laughs> when you're composing, what, what, what do you have on the paper? Or is it an improvised lyric? Wait, uh, any particular piece interest you? I mean, we can show you. I the mean, last well, piece. You said the, the, what, this the was last one we just did? Last night or yesterday. Oh, the, the oh speaking of dreams? Uh, uh, the part, uh, the part that was composed, was the melody that you heard. Uh, Don, we'll just give him a little example. <laughs> Actually, apropos to your question earlier about uh, 
harmony and pitch information. The last piece we played, uh, the one we played twice, is basically there's no pitch information. It's just rhythms. And, and, and it's, so in other words, it's, it's basically plotting out the timeline, and we play this stuff together choosing our own pitches. And then uh, after that, it's open form improvisation based on the ideas that are implied by this to each of us, however we. And, and of course, like there's a little bit of 4-4 four, four time in it, so that sort of brings up the whole, that whole world of time playing and jazz that can also be part of the improvisation. So, it, you know, there's sort of common um, things that we choose, that we draw from based on what was on, on the page. But no, no pitch information. And that all that stuff is our choice. Yes, Suppose somebody got inspired and wanted to modulate. How do you signal that? Hey, I'm going up. <laughs> Don did it to me in, uh, well, a couple of pieces ago. You just hear it. I'm, I'm, I'm hearing him ah. here. Uh, there was, which piece was it? Uh, speaking of dreams, was it? Mm -hmm. Dawn decided to shift keys. I just heard it and went with her. <laughs> Okay, so she gave you a leading code yeah, or something so, like so, that, and then everybody just goes. Sometimes, yeah, sometimes. Sometimes, Jane. Let's have a look. Well, yeah, well, you, you use a lot of gesture, mm -hmm. and if you are the place without those rhythmics, that's what it's all about. Mm -hmm. You know, your ears are connected to your body. Mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. uh, maybe the one thing we haven't done, uh, we. I don't know, we're getting toward the end of the time here, but uh, one of the things I mentioned in the paragraph is how distinctly unique each one of the musician's personal melodic, uh, harmonic, rhythmic, timbral uh, vocabulary is. And yet, you know, somehow that is so much a part of the music, and then it, it's also something happens that, that all those personal, uh, musical vocabularies can come together to, to make a sound. So there's this piece uh, we do called Vanishing Hat, which, which features uh, the individual statements of the musicians. Uh, maybe we'll play a little bit of that for you. Hmm. So I have a cool. book. Yeah. Too many, too many. Oh, I got it. Yeah, right. I have it okay. here. Okay. I just want to say, maybe I have my own shot. I'll just look at yours. Yeah, I know. You got some red flags? I got a red flag. Yeah, I got a red flag. Oh, no. Oh, jeez. I threw that one. I get it. I threw that one. All right, don't hurt the scrub. It's going to use his brush. Gently down. Gently. Hey, what's the new idea? It shows us. How's the next one coming? You're making something up with you. I got one. I'm going to say one. Right here. Mark. Oh, sorry. All right, I'm passing out to you guys. You throw it up when you're in the house. Good catch. Good catch. Oh, jeez. <laughs> A musician, right? Can't catch. Yeah, cannot be catch. Good catch. Okay. The musician can't catch. There you go. That's perfect. <laughs> yeah, you didn't represent, man. Yeah, but come on. Throw it out, man. <laughs> Oh, we just start on this concept.
couple of... Uh, Where's the flag? Where's the flag? Where's the flag? No, we got, we got a flag. Two flags. Two flags. <laughs> thank you so much. Look, please may I thank these extraordinary musicians once again. And we've so